John Dorman is watching. Canada has joined the United States as the 102nd through 116th states. The world is divided into five trade blocks. A prolonged and controversial world war is being waged in the Horn of Africa. A deranged serial killer named the Jabberwock is terrorizing the country. Martian colonies, communication with dolphins, and arcologies are becoming a reality. Route 66 is still in commission, and Boulder Dam never changed its name. It's a world similar yet markedly different from our own, where things seem normal on the surface, but bizarre things lurk in the shadows. In this world, after a mysterious five-year road trip, Paul Gray has returned to his father's hometown of River City, Wabash, specifically an area of the city referred to by locals as the Forest. Over time, the city has deteriorated into an urban wasteland due in part to the exploitive business practices of Paul's wicked great-grandfather, Silas Foster. However, Silas has died, and Paul has inherited his vast fortune. Will Paul use the money to reverse the damage and restore the city to its former glory? Or will he fall prey to the same sins of pride, lust, and greed which destroyed his ancestor? Paul discovers that he must tackle many problems at the same time, dislodge a street gang who is squatting in the sub-basements of his apartment building, discharge a dictatorial hotel manager, repair the roof of an iconic church, and rescue a failing diner threatened with foreclosure. To solve these and other problems, Paul must rely on his martial arts and communication skills, his innate compassion and generosity, and his faith in God. At every step, Paul and his motley band of helpers are met by the forces of Silas Gray's former partner, Claude Zambini, a.k.a. Zumbo the Clown. Zambini, who is the host of a popular local morning children's show, an unscrupulous businessman, and most importantly, a powerful crime lord, has an iron chokehold on the city and its residents, and no intention of allowing it to be wrested from his grasp. The eccentric Sam Hain, proprietor of a local horror-themed amusement park and Paul's distant cousin, offers to assist Paul in defeating Zumbini. However, can Paul trust him? Moreover, what is the peculiar gold signet ring which Hain gave Paul? It seems to have its own agenda. At the oddest times, it glows, and strange events soon follow. What will Paul do with the Melissa Ring? Hello, my name is Robert Wayne B., and I'm the author of the Melissa Ring, and I've just read to you the back cover blurb of that book, and uh, this is a online version of a library event that you might uh, participate in sometime if I'm in I'm in your area where I read sections of the book and also uh, provide a few little personal anecdotes about uh, myself and about what I was thinking when I when I wrote certain parts of the book so if I'm ever going to be in your area I would appreciate that you come out and listen to uh, listen to uh, my reading and uh, perhaps ask me some questions and uh, and introduce yourself. I'd like to enter. I'd like to uh, read chapter one of the book, and it goes as follows. As Paul rode his motorcycle across the Audubon Memorial Bridge, he found himself humming "Back Home Again in Indiana." He chuckled as he realized his mistake. While Paul was indeed returning to River City, River City was no longer in the state of Indiana. The southern part of the state had seceded to form the new state of Wabash during his five-year absence. Paul did not know how long it would take him to get used to that, but he did not know how long it would take to get used to River City being his home again either. At the foot of the bridge, Paul passed the new sign which read, Welcome to Wabash, 100th State of the Union. Under that sign was a smaller white sign which read, Entering Adams County. Paul had not expected that one and wondered why they had changed the county name. One hundred yards past that was a more familiar sign which read, Welcome to River City. Paul eased the motorcycle onto the South Street exit ramp, navigated the sharp 270-degree turn, and then merged into the westbound traffic of South Street. This would take him directly to the forest. The forest was not an actual forest, but the old downtown and southwest section of River City. 
there were numerous theories about how the forest got its name. Some people believed it was because it bordered a large wooded area along the Wabash and Ohio rivers, which it did. Others believed it was because so many of the streets in the forest were named after either trees or numbers, which was also true. Actually, the forest was a derogatory term for Forest Township, which was named after Colonel Robert Forrest, a Revolutionary War hero. When Paul reached Pine Avenue, he turned right and drove four blocks to the Pine Avenue parking garage. Paul entered the garage, passed the empty attendance booth, wondered when it was last occupied, and turned right. The ground floor of the parking garage was full. It usually was. Even as deserted as the forest had become in recent years, there was still enough traffic to fill the bottom floors of the parking garage. The top floors occasionally filled. The basement floors never filled. There were reasons for that. First was demand. There was simply not enough demand for parking in the forest. Second was knowledge. Few people knew the basement floors even existed. Third was fear. Few who knew about those floors were brave enough to go down there. Some people even thought they were haunted. Paul descended to the basement level, where there were a few cars. As he passed through the sub-basement, he noticed one car parked next to the stairwell. He continued to the second sub-basement, the bottommost floor, where there was only a pickup truck and a sports car. His paternal grandparents had parked his truck exactly where he had asked them. His maternal grandfather had purchased the new sports car on Paul's behalf and had it parked next to the truck against Paul's explicit wishes. Paul parked the bike he had spent the last five years on next to the pickup and climbed off it. Paul loosened the chin strap and removed his helmet. The cold air of the parking garage was invigorating as it made contact with the light perspiration on his head. Paul had been riding for almost eight hours and he was eager to stretch his legs and feel fresh air on his face even if it was cold. After he secured the helmet to the back of the motorcycle, he removed his saddlebag, which contained his possessions of the last five years. It was difficult to grasp that one stage of his life was now complete, as another one was just beginning. He opened the driver's side door of the truck and tossed the saddlebag over onto the passenger side of the bench. Over the visor, as he knew there would be, there was an envelope with his name on it. Paul closed the truck door, opened the envelope, pocketed the keys that fell out, and extracted a note. Dear Paul, welcome home. Pop and I know you can do this. Call us when you get settled in. Sooner if you need something. Love, Nan. P.S. Your dad would be so proud of you. Paul reread the letter, smiled, and almost cried before replacing it in the envelope. He folded the envelope and tucked it into the pocket of his jacket as he walked past a door marked Restricted Area, Authorized Personnel Only, and towards the stairwell. As Paul climbed three flights of stairs to the ground level of the parking garage, he questioned his decision to avoid using the tunnels. It was certainly a quicker, more direct route to his destination. It would be much warmer than walking outside in the cold wind, and unless some vandal had broken down one of the access doors while he was away, the tunnels would be deserted. But was that not contrary to his mission, what Nan and Pop had challenged him to do, what his entire family and a fair number of friends in their own ways had groomed him to do? If he ever attended to help the citizens of the forest in River City, he would have to walk amongst them. When Paul emerged from the parking garage, he was rudely greeted by a cold gale from the north and the imposing facade of the Canterbury, which loomed in front of and over him. He turned left, walking along Pine Avenue for a half block. Although he had just been on a motorcycle for almost nine hours, Paul had not felt cold until he exited the parking garage. The frigid wind hit his back, and Paul adjusted the scarf which Nan had given him over five years ago, raising it higher on the back of his neck. Then, while painfully remembering a jaywalking citation he received from the River City Police Department on his first day of college several years ago, he turned right, crossing Pine Avenue legally at the intersection. He was now walking west along 3rd Street with the Canterbury on his right. It had been his home during college, and it would be his home again. As he approached Oak Avenue, Paul was able to see more and more of the Imperial Hotel. Like the Canterbury, the Imperial Hotel towered physically over Oak Avenue, and like the Canterbury, it, was towered, it also towered over him emotionally. The Imperial Hotel was where he had worked as a front desk clerk during college, and he would be working there again, but this time in a much different capacity. Turning right on Oak Avenue and lost in the reveries of yesterday, Paul collided 
with another pedestrian. Okay, if you come to one of my uh, events, I'm going to be telling certain stories that I won't tell here, and vice versa. That way, if, you, if you've uh, listened to me this long, uh, and then you come out to an event, and if you read a, if you read the book, there's going to be things that uh, you uh, you get from one that you didn't get from the other. If you read a book, you're not going to get the the little anecdotes. If uh, you come out to the event, uh, besides the uh, the the one on one uh, interaction with you, uh, there's certain stories that I share there, and certain chapters of the book that I read that I don't do here. But one of them that, that you're only going to get here, I won't, I won't mention it when I'm, when I'm out uh, at the libraries doing, doing the readings, is uh, about the gang members' names. Uh, I have hidden all sorts of, of Christian symbols and uh, themes in the book, and one of them is in the gang members' names. Now, there's 15 uh, gang members, and... Uh, 11 of them, I don't count Judas, 11 of them have uh, the members, uh, have the names of the uh, Christ's apostles. Uh, instead of Peter, it's Pedro. Instead of Andrew, it's Andre. Instead of uh, Bartholomew, it's Bartolome. But if you notice the names of the gang members, they are the names of Jesus' apostles in Spanish. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention uh, of the little hidden things uh, that uh, you may discover on your own in the book. Uh, Zach Armstrong, and you heard me read about Zach Armstrong in uh, the last chapter. That's one of uh, uh, Paul Gray's old friends. I wanted Zach Armstrong to be sort of like a Joseph uh, from the Old Testament. And I wanted him to have uh, a, a lot of brothers uh, 11 of them to be exact, and one sister, which if you're familiar with the, the book of Genesis, is the way the children of Israel lined up. There were, there were 12 boys and one girl, and just like in the Armstrong family, there are 12 boys and one girl, and all of them have a first name starting with a Z. I had to get really creative, and I didn't list them all in here. Uh, you, you'll only meet a couple of them in the first book, but I guarantee all... 13 of the siblings will show up throughout the series in one way or another. But that's just two things that uh, are Christian related that are hidden in the book. There are more. I, I'm, not, I'm never going to tell all of them. But just so you can sort of be, be looking, uh, there's, there's a couple. Uh, thank you for, thank you for uh, uh, sitting here and listening uh, to me read from my book. I've enjoyed writing it. I hope you've enjoyed listening to it. I hope you'll enjoy uh, reading it. And there will be a purchase link uh, where you can purchase a copy of the book. Uh, it is not on the shelves in bookstores, but it is available through online bookstores, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, but Lulu.com, where uh, uh, it's uh, printed, uh, also has it available. And that link will be in the description. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, uh, or you know a friend who would, I would appreciate it if you would share it with your friends. Uh, like, comments, questions, you know the drill with social media and videos. Uh, let me know what you think. Uh, again, thank you for, uh, for listening, and uh, please buy my book.